Welcome back. Here we are in our Roman study, our third week. And today we're looking at Romans 2, 1 through 16. We're going to be looking at the judgment of God and, and really wrestling with this idea of, is God fair? We certainly know that God is a judge. Is he a fair judge? I wonder if you talk to your friends, your neighbors, family members, uh, maybe some folks who don't maybe know Jesus as Lord and Savior, what are their thoughts regarding the judgment of God? Would they maybe say he's too severe? Or would they say he's not judging enough? Because as we look at our world, our society, we see so much gone wrong and so much pain, suffering, unrest. Uh, some would argue that God isn't judging enough, that he should judge more severely those who are engaging in certain behaviors. So uh, we're going to talk about that, the fairness of God. And we're looking at Romans 2 verses 1 through 16. And that is our, that is our text that we're going to work through. I think of, when we think of God's judgment, first of all, do we really like to be judged? I'll just be honest. I don't really like to be judged. In fact, I, I think there are times if we even sense that we're being judged by someone else, we kind of we kind of get defensive, we kind of get a little angry, we kind of get a little, little upset. We don't like to be judged. And we'll even say, hey, don't judge me. Ironically, where we have no interest in being judged, we seem to have no problem judging others. <laughs> Funny how that works. Uh, now, you might want to ask yourself the question, who would be a more fair judge, you or God? Obviously, I would argue that God is the fairer judge, and I think Scripture will bear that out. But I will say that oftentimes when it comes to the definition of fairness, we tend to use our definition and not God's. And of course, that gets us into trouble. I'm sure that in the whole topic of judgment, you may have had somebody who judged you harshly and often. Uh, perhaps it was this lady. <laughs> My wife found this, found this picture this week and I, I, I couldn't resist including it. So apparently this lady with the big hair might have been the one judging you. I don't know. But I know who would not have been judging you. My dear sweet mother, she was not one that judged others. Matter of fact, she taught me regularly not to judge others. And she would say, Kevin, that person is someone that Jesus died for. So thanks, mom. Thanks, mom, for not judging me. <laughs> um, we know that our actions deserve judgment. That, that's one of the things that whether or not we like to be judged we do know, I believe, at the core of our understanding that we do things that are deserving of judgment. We don't like to receive that judgment. But at the end of the day, we can't walk away and say, well, I, I don't deserve to be judged. We know that we all deserve to be judged. I would love to avoid judgment, but I know for a fact that that's not reality. So if I'm going to be judged, it would help that that judge be fair. We're going to take a look at God's judgment. Let's go ahead and look at our text. Romans 2, we're going to look at verses 1 through 11. And I'll go ahead and read that. You can follow along on the screen. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. Because you, the judge... Practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. 
To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. So we, what we have here in the beginning of this chapter is a situation where Paul writes to the church at Rome and he is addressing some self-appointed judges. How many, how many of you have met a self-appointed judge? Likely it was that lady with the big hair, right? <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't have a right to be your judge. She just kind of assumed the position and began to judge you. Oftentimes we find this in the church where you have folks who are very self-righteous and they begin to look down their nose at others and they begin to say things that, that put them down and, and they criticize and they judge and they condemn. And it's all about this self-righteous attitude where they have not taken the proper step of judging themselves first but rather they simply just judge others. And this is the situation we have here in the church at Rome. We have self-appointed judges and, and Paul has some pretty strong words for these who have declared themselves judges of others. Now, first of all, we need to understand in this mix, we have Jewish people who had the law. It's one of those scenarios where in today's church, we don't we don't have this Jew versus Gentile kind of tension going on in the church, but this was a great reality at the time that Paul writes this letter to the church at Rome. You have Jews who for years and, and centuries had the Mosaic law. They were so proud having been recipients of God's law given through Moses. And so it was a list of rules that they were to do or not do. It was all about their works. And so they were able to measure themselves by how well they kept the law. Well, you can already see where the danger of that is, right? Because these who were self-righteous, kind of self-appointed judges, judged that they were keeping the law better than others. And in fact, what really had become an issue is here, now... This church at Rome comes together because the gospel is preached and Jews become Christians and they believe in Jesus as Messiah, as Lord and Savior, as the only way of salvation. Well, now the law being fulfilled in Christ, they're not obligated to fulfill the law. But some of them had a hard time letting go of that. And so they looked at their Gentile friends who all they had to do was place their faith in Jesus Christ. They didn't have to keep the law. Well, the Gentiles judge those Gentiles, the Jews judge those Gentiles because they, they didn't have to do as much. Didn't seem fair. <laughs> you had Gentiles looking at the situation saying, well, I haven't done any, any of the major sins. And so even though I didn't have the law, I'm, I'm judging myself as being pretty good. And so they were self-righteous over maybe other Gentiles who were not quite as holy as they were. And you even have those who would be hearing this letter who would be considered non-believing pagans. And they fit in here somewhere as well as those who have never really received God's law and yet they're trying to follow a moral code of some kind as well. And so they might even have been a little self-righteous and, and judging. And, and so Paul addresses really all people here who are self-righteous judges. Now, I want to say this carefully because we will hear someone say, we're not to judge, we're never supposed to judge. And certainly in this context, that is correct. We should not be setting ourselves up as self-righteous judges of other people. 
However, there is judging in Scripture where what we're really talking about is discernment. And so we are to judge whether or not something lines itself up with Scripture and meets the test of the truth of Scripture. That is a kind of judging that we are to do, but that falls under the category of what we would call discernment. I just want, that's a little sidebar there, but I, I, I want to clarify because sometimes people will just make that say, well, we're not supposed to judge, period. Well, we are supposed to judge uh, ourselves, in fact. Scripture says we are to test ourselves to see if we are truly in the faith. Well, that's kind of a self-judgment, isn't it? Uh, we are to test the scriptures to see if what someone who is teaching the scriptures to see if it lines up and is true. And the Bereans were actually praised because they tested the scriptures to see that what Paul said was correct. So that kind of judging is correct. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, take a look at our first discussion question. According to verse verses one through four. Why is it dangerous to judge someone else? How many of you love these answers? I, I'm telling you, I am so, I get so excited when I get to read all of your answers. You have some great ones. So here we go. According to verses one through four, why is it dangerous to judge someone else? We're looking in a mirror. We might as well say mirror, mirror on the wall. <laughs> Who's the greatest sinner of all? Or Matthew 7, 3 and 4, why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but fail to see the beam of wood, 2 by 4, 2020 version, <laughs> in your own? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye while there is a beam in your own? Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the biggest sinner of them all? Friend, that's that really speaks to it, doesn't it? What is the danger? What is the danger of being a self-righteous judge? We have way too much sin all on our own that we haven't dealt with. And here we are looking at somebody else's sin. We really can fall into the same exact category of these people that Paul is addressing in the Church of Rome. Here's an answer. I don't feel God would want us to judge. I think we have our own baggage. We do not need to carry others. We are not fit. Think about that. If you were to spend all of your time worrying about your own sinfulness, your own baggage that you have to carry, you won't have any time to deal with anybody else's, will you? We all have so much on our own. And I, I, I like the, the idea of this, the idea of carrying baggage in, and in a sense, we are to carry our cross as well, aren't we? Follow the Lord. The point is that with what we do have to carry, carrying our cross, carrying our own issues, our own baggage, we've all got stuff, don't we? There's no room to be carrying somebody else's. That's a great answer. All right. Now, let's look at the next question here. What is the difference between human judgment and God's judgment, I would like to think there's quite a bit quite a bit of difference between the two. What is the difference between human judgment and God's judgment? God's judgment, this answer says, God's judgment is totally justified. Verse 2 says that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. I think the key word in that verse is rightly. When we are often not doing it in a we are often not doing it in a justified manner we tend to judge others out of our anger envy and pride verse 4 of the scripture passage mentions god's kindness although god is our judge he is also merciful and rich in kindness knowing that we deserve god's full judgment and wrath yet being shown god's kindness and forgiveness should drive us to repent our flawed human judgment lacks kindness and forgiveness in every way we often judge people ruthlessly, aiming to make us feel better about ourselves and belittle others. Thus, we lack in compassion, kindness, mercy, and forgiveness. Again, God is the only worthy one that can sit enthroned as judge over all the earth and his people. So we better not be thinking that we can share in that job or else. <laughs> what a great answer. And I think this really... This is really something for us to consider. 
God is the righteous judge. It is Scripture makes it so clear that the, the only one who is in the proper place of judgment is God himself. We're not, we're not qualified. And so when I set myself up as judge over somebody else, I'm not qualified for that job. God is the only worthy one that can sit enthroned as judge over the earth and his people. That's right. His standard, his measuring stick of judgment is not the same as ours. And his, holy, his holiness is not ours. Our holiness is filthy rags, scripture would say, right? Our righteousness is filthy rags. So by comparison, God's holiness, there's, through all, there's no comparison. So when we think about God's judgment versus our judgment, no comparison. All right. Another answer here, our human judgment tends to be biased in our own favor, while God's judgment is absolutely true. Such a perfect answer. That's absolutely right. Our human judgment is biased. Think about it. We're probably willing to be critical about certain things, but the things that we really know that we're really doing wrong and, and it's really egregious, well, we just conveniently, we don't, we don't judge those areas. <laughs> we just ignore those areas. We're not good judges because our judgment is biased. Those things that are really, really wrong, that are really displeasing to the Lord, we don't judge those. We judge the areas where we feel that we're doing well, and we say, we judge ourselves, hey, pretty good. Our human judgment is biased. That's an absolute fact. God's judgment is absolutely true. All right. Well, the reality is, as we have begun to see here, when we, when we compare the judges of God being judge and ourselves being judges, what we find is that God is a much better judge. And one of the things I love in these verses here is that God is a better judge in that God is patient. Notice how God who is most holy, God who has every right to wipe us off the planet right now. Okay, because by his holy and perfect standard, we don't match up. God could simply eliminate all that is sinful, all that is rebellious, all that is unlike him, all that is unholy, all that is unrighteous, and just wipe it off the map, which would mean we would be toast. But he's patient. In fact, even though he could judge us immediately, it says here that his kindness has a purpose in leading us to repentance. So God could ultimately just lower the boom and judge us, and yet his desire is that we would come to repentance. And so he offers us mercy and kindness, which we do not deserve, with the intent of drawing us to repentance and relationship with him. That is such an incredible thing. Oftentimes, folks think that God's patience is forgetfulness, almost as if, well, God must just have forgot about my sin. I'm good. No, he hasn't forgotten. He's being patient with you, hoping that you will come to repentance. He will ultimately bring judgments against all lawlessness. That's made very clear in this passage. All lawlessness will be dealt with. All sin will be judged. But he's patient. He's not partial like we would be. He's thorough in his judgment, but he also offers mercy. Whereas in our judgment, we don't tend to offer the kindness, do we? We don't tend to offer mercy to others in the hopes that they will come around and repent of their sin and get that relationship restored. We don't offer that same offer of mercy and kindness at all, do we? Let's take a look. Next question here. What impact does God's refusal to show favoritism have on you personally? 
Consider your current relationship with God as well as your relationships with other people. What impact does God's refusal to show favoritism have on you personally? If life's not fair, well, neither is favoritism. I'm thankful I serve a God who calls it as he sees it. Sin is sin. It gives me confidence and peace knowing that God is unchangeable, sovereign, and patient. Amen to that. I also know God is trustworthy in forgiving and forgetting my sins, yet continues to draw me to humility even when I take my eyes off of him. Since we are all declared sinners by God, we then are all equal. Ephesians 4.32 tells me to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave me. That is such a profound answer. We're all on the same level, aren't we? Our sinfulness puts us on an equal playing field. All guilty, all deserving of judgment. And so there is this confidence in knowing that God's going to treat me fairly. And because God treats me fairly, I then need to treat others fairly. What a great answer. I'm so thankful for this. And, and it's interesting, just as God was kind to us, he was tenderhearted towards us, he was forgiving towards us, we then are to be kind towards others, tenderhearted towards others, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave us. What a wonderful example that is. Next, next uh, answer. Question three ties directly to the first two questions. God is no respecter of persons, so his judgment is always fair. I feel in a much better place hiding behind Jesus when it comes to judgment because my righteousness is filthy rags. I would rather be judged through the lens of Jesus. Now, I want to go back and look at this answer a little more, more deeply. This answer shows that this person understands what Jesus has done for us. So we understand that every, every one of us deserves the judgment and wrath of God. Every one of us. And the difference between, in the long end of things here, the difference between someone who never receives Jesus Christ, someone who never places their faith in him, and, re and receives God's forgiveness and someone like myself who has placed their faith in Christ and been forgiven. The, di the difference is both of us, what is similar is that both of us have a issue that has to be dealt with. God's wrath is still rightly coming towards me. But what happens? Because I've placed my faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ steps in the way of God's wrath and says, I'll take that wrath upon myself so that my child doesn't have to take it. And so Jesus takes the wrath that God the Father rightly wants to bestow upon me and he places it upon his own back at the cross. And so the wrath of God was satisfied at the cross for us. So this is, uh, I, I really like the way this is phrased. I'm in a much better place hiding behind Jesus when it comes to judgment. That friend, that is exactly the right place to be. We need to hide behind Jesus when it comes to judgment because he takes the punishment for us, that takes the wrath of God for us. What, a, what an excellent answer. All right. We are certainly bad judges god is whereas god is a better judge we are we are terrible judges we tend to be critical of everyone but ourselves as we've already looked at we tend to ignore the areas where we really need to be judged most severely we are biased in our judgment we we condemn others for the very things that we're doing i think of I think of how Jesus came and really pointed that out to us, right? You had, the, you had the Pharisees so confident in their own righteousness. They were the, not only the, the, were they Jews, but they were the teachers of the law. And so they would have the Mosaic law and they would read it and they would expound on it. And then they were very convinced that they were keeping the law. And so Jesus comes along and 
he really confronted their self-righteous, judgmental, condemning attitude. And as you read through the Sermon on the Mount, which I would certainly recommend you do, go ahead and take a look at uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 and read the things that Jesus spoke there. But in particular, he does things where the Pharisees would have said, well, I haven't killed anybody. See, pat myself on the back, judge, self-righteous judging, right? haven't killed anybody, doing good. And Jesus says, if you have hatred in your heart towards your brother, you're a murderer. But <laughs> Jesus exposes the flimsy judging that they are using on themselves and says to the core of your heart, your hatred towards your brother is just as bad as the act of committing murder. He says, oh, and by the way, you say that you're not, you've never committed adultery but you've looked lustfully at a woman in your heart. It's the, same, it's the same thing. That's one of the things that really that Jesus does that helps us in the, all of this. Jesus exposes the flimsiness of how we measure our own sin, of how we judge righteousness and unrighteousness. And he says, your standard doesn't even come close to mine. We are very bad judges. All right. Well, let's take a, a look. We're going to continue in our reading here. Romans 2 verses 12 through 16. Let's go ahead and read those last verses. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. It's interesting here. So, understand the dynamic you have the jews who received the law and this is what this is what paul is addressing here they had received the law of moses they had received the ten commandments they had understood for instance you shall have no other gods before me you shall not covet you shall not lie you shall not steal all of these things that were part of the mosaic law they had that the Gentiles did not have that. And so that's why he says you have the Gentiles who are essentially a law unto themselves. In other words, they had a moral code that was their conscience written on their heart. We're going to talk about that in a few, in a few more moments here as we take a look at these upcoming discussion questions. But at least as we look at these verses, understand the context of you had the Jews who were very familiar with the Mosaic law, they had received it, they had grown up with it since birth, and they were very proud of that. You have the Gentiles who did not grow up with this understanding of Mosaic law, and yet there was some sort of standard that they adhered to. We're going to talk about that. All right. So the question then, next, next discussion question for us is, what, according to Romans 2, 12 through 16, is the relationship between God's law and and judgment. What is the relationship between God's law and judgment? Here we go. God's judgment is not based on our knowledge of the law, but on our actions. Even those who have not been taught God's law can instinctively be led to obey when they follow their conscience. Okay, so this answer kind of kind of spells out what I had already implied is there is this idea of the, our conscience, in fact, helps us to understand God's law. All right. Here's another answer. For God will judge everyone impartially for sinning based on a godly standard. And because we being human cannot even keep our own standard of good, all the more reason why we need the gospel and Jesus. Now this is true. So God judges everyone impartially because we've all violated his standard. And again, it's so important for us to understand whether or not we've received the Mosaic law or not. 
whether that person who is in a in a tribe somewhere in some far off jungle in some place that has no has has never received any sort of standard if you will of of god's law even they are going to be held to a standard of what it whatever revelation they have received remember as we when we looked at the end of romans chapter one what did we discover that god had revealed himself to mankind that his divine nature and his eternal qualities were clearly seen by what what had been made and that man rather than giving glory to god and thanks to him suppress the knowledge of the truth and worship the created things rather than the creator. And as a result, Paul says they are without excuse and under God's wrath. So no one gets a free pass here. We are going to be judged according to the standard that we have understood. But make no mistake, everybody's judged. Nobody gets a free pass. It's really bad news for everyone, isn't it? <laughs> here's, the, here's the great idea of no partiality. It's bad news for everybody. Everybody is guilty. Everybody is deserving of punishment. The Gentiles who have not heard the law are going to be judged by what they do understand. The Jews will be judged by the law that they have received, and they will be found quite wanting in that area. The pagans who know nothing will still be judged because as Romans 1 made so very clear, they're without excuse. Here's the point. We had begun looking at this idea, is God fair? Well, yes, he is. God is fair and God is even merciful. But nobody, nobody gets away from God's judgment because God is fair. All right. Let's take a look at another question here. Verse 15 speaks of the conscience. Why is a conscience important in this setting? And I think we've kind of already seen a little bit of the answer to this, but let's hear some of your awesome answers. <laughs> it shows that God was thinking of and preparing the Gentiles as well. He gave the written law to the Israelites. He wrote the unwritten law on the hearts of the Gentiles, hence their conscience. Like the written law, this, this too pointed to the need for a Savior. I think that's really an excellent answer. Whether or not you received the Jewish law or the law that God had written on your conscience, all of it was enough to point you to the need for a Savior. Here's the thing. The law is not enough to save us. The law, in fact, can't save us. The law, all the law does, whether it's the Jewish Mosaic law or the law written on our hearts, the law is enough to convict us, not to save us. And, and we're going to see that as we continue to go through the book of Romans. And we're going to talk about salvation. We're going to talk about what it means to be declared not guilty by receiving the imparted righteousness of Christ. We're going to talk about all that. But right now in our study in Romans 2, where we are right now, this is helping us to understand something. And that is that whatever law we have received, it is enough to condemn us, not to save us, okay? Uh, and that's what this answer tells us. Like the written law, this too pointed to the need for a Savior. Regardless of what law you've received, you need a Savior. And then here's another answer. God has given us a conscience. Paul says, even Gentiles who do not know God's law instinctively follow what the law says they demonstrate that God's law is written within them. And so this conscience helps us to know, ooh, I did wrong. This is something is wrong about this. Even the, the pagan, the non-believer, does things and knows something's wrong. I'm I'm out of I'm I'm out of sync with my creator. Something is something is clearly amiss here. Now the problem is because they haven't received the revelation of Christ, because they don't know who Christ is, they don't know who the Savior is, the law of their conscience is enough, again, enough to convict them, but they don't yet know how to be saved. That's really the problem, isn't it? And last question for us I want to look at here. Verse 15 speaks of the conscience. 
Oops, wait a minute. Okay, that that <laughs> that's a wrong slide. That what that should say is what can we do to cultivate a healthy conscience? <laughs> All right. Answer, I pray for a hedge of protection around my mind and thoughts. I try to avoid entertainment that leads me to bad thoughts. When I find myself having self-righteous arguments in my head, I pray for God's help and turning my mind onto his word and positive thoughts. The renewing of my mind is a constant battle, a battle that only God can win. The more I practice the presence of God, the more quickly I recognize bad thoughts and the sooner I seek God's help in purposely cultivating my conscience and thoughts. Note, I include dwelling on past sins that God has already forgiven in my bad thoughts. Dealing with sin and conviction versus bad thoughts can be a very fine line, and Satan likes to play mind games, but greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Well, amen to that. What a great answer. And you know, the idea of cultivating a healthy conscience involves exactly what we're reading here. This answer is saying, I need to get closer to the presence of God. I need to stay closer to what God says about me and not listen to what Satan says about me. You know who's a real uh, nasty judge? Satan himself. Revelation describes Satan as the accuser of the brethren. A judge who's not fit to be a judge. <laughs> it's exactly what the devil is. He is a judge who's not fit to be a judge. And judgment is coming for him for sure. But for us, in this idea of cultivating a healthy conscience, it's important that we stay renewed in our mind and in our thinking. Scripture talks about taking every thought captive and making it obedient to the knowledge of Christ. We need to do that. We need, we need to take targeted action against wrong thinking. We need to stay in tune with what the Lord tells us. Spend time in his word. Spend time in his presence. I really love this answer. Great answer. What else can we do to help cultivate a healthy conscience? Answer, we all have a moral compass. We are born knowing right from wrong, regardless if you are a Christian. A healthy conscience comes from staying in the word, being connected to God, obeying him, trusting him, honoring him, and giving thanks to him always, not just when it appeals to our needs. Great answer. Let's go back. I want to read the beginning of that. This, a healthy conscience comes from staying in the word, being connected to God. I, I cannot agree with that more. We need to stay connected to the Word of God. We need to be in the Word of God. And you know what? The fact that you're watching this Bible study, that you're a part of this Bible study, that you're contributing, you're answering the questions, you're engaged, and you're, you know what you're doing? You're getting closer to the Lord, and you're getting into the Word of God and being connected to Him. It's that kind of thing that helps you to have a more healthy conscience. Obeying Him, trusting Him, honoring Him, giving thanks to Him always. That's, that really goes a long way. And developing a healthy conscience. Great answers again this week. Incredible answers. So what we find is before we talk about salvation, which we will in the book of Romans, we find judgment. Bad news always precedes good news. The, the, the gospel is good news. Why? Because it is a response to the bad news of our sinful condition. Before we can understand justification, we need to understand judgment. God needs to judge us. In fact, friend, God needs to judge you. And as you feel the immense guilt of your condition, that's when you can cry out to him for salvation, which he most certainly will provide. As we walk in Christ, we are able to have a conscience that informs us of what we're doing. A good conscience helps us to see our own sin instead of seeing somebody else's sin. A good conscience shows us where we're walking away from the Lord instead of walking to him. God has given us that inner voice to help us identify sin and know where we've gone wrong. I want to challenge you and encourage you don't ignore the conscience that Christ has given you. The more that you ignore it, the less effective it will be for you. And the deeper you will fall into error. 
the more in tune we are with God's truth, the less likely we are to judge others. And so we need to consume ourselves with the truth of who God is and who we are in relation to him. That ought to keep us busy enough <laughs> so that we won't have to worry about other people's sinful condition. I'll close with this quote. You know, you guys get to have all these great dis uh, discussion answers, and, and they're so good. So I figured I'd give one of my own. One key thing for us to understand about judgment is that we are all deserving of it. God is fair when he judges. The other thing for us to recognize is that it is unfair for God to offer us mercy. But he does it out of his kindness. We need to act like him, offer mercy, not judgment. I hope you caught that. What we see is God showing, in the midst of judgment, which he is offering and, and promising, in the midst of God's judgment, he offers mercy and kindness so that we will be led to repentance. And we then are to see that model. And instead of judging our brother, we should offer him mercy and kindness, hoping that that leads our brother to repentance. And whether or not they come to repentance or not, us offering that mercy and that kindness shows that we are walking in the ways that Christ would have us to walk. And our heart will be changed. We won't have condemnation and, and anger and hatred in our heart towards that person. We won't be condemning them because we're too busy offering mercy and kindness. All right. So I thank you so much for being a part of this study today. Coming next week. <laughs> well, let's take a look. We're going to read Romans 2, 17 through chapter 3, verse 8. So that uh, verse 17 of chapter 2, read all the way through the end of the chapter and the first eight verses of chapter 3. And answer the questions. Now, I will have the questions posted on the Facebook page, but here they are as well if you want to get a sneak preview. And in fact, if you were watching this, you could always rewind it and check them out again. But answer the questions. What are some false assumptions that people make about gaining God's favor? Maybe you've heard in certain circles people talk about God's favor quite a bit. Well, what are some false assumptions that people make about gaining God's favor? Number two, the people described in Romans 2, 17 through 29 assumed that they had a good relationship with God. What kind of things did they depend on to give them that relationship? You'll have to read and find out. In Romans 2, 24, Paul says God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. That's a pretty heavy statement. Why is that? Number four, what does it mean to have a circumcised heart? challenging question how have you seen the spirit at work in your heart i'm looking forward to those answers those will be exciting and number six how would you respond to a person who said i'm glad i fell so deeply into wrong it shows how good god is and how much he will forgive <laughs> how would you respond to that maybe you've said that how would you respond to yourself <laughs> all right all right well to all of you who have participated in this study this week, thank you so much. I really appreciate the privilege and opportunity to meet with you here weekly and, and share the truth of God's word and so thankful for you being a part. Please use the Facebook group page and write in there. Just honestly, if you would write how you're enjoying this study, maybe something you've learned, a, a benefit that you've had uh, being a part of the study, please go on to our, our Facebook group, Romans, A Gospel Worth Dying For, that group page, and just write a little something in there about how you feel about this study and maybe the, a way that it's been an encouragement to you, and I certainly hope it has. It's been an encouragement and a help to me. And so thank you for being a part of this. Thank you for being a blessing to me and helping me in my walk with Christ. All right, until next time, God bless you. <laughs>